by Secretary uh, Dr. Jose Romero of the Department of Health, uh, also a uh, Secretary Thank you for Now, uh, weekly update, uh, who's our please program be joined today for by vaccine Secretary distribution. Uh, Dr. Jose and, Romero uh, of the Department of primarily Health. Primarily, we want to first talk about uh, Secretary uh, vaccines John today. The Department of Education. And then we'll move into our Colonel, case uh, report. Uh, Ader, and who's our let's program just go ahead and look at for the vaccine. chart that we have received in the state. Um, under, under the state program, 975,000. And uh, we have allocated 60 not allocated, we have put those vaccines into the arms of our Kansans by 62.4% of those. And you can see, just look at the day before, obviously at the beginning of the week we receive our uh, vaccine allocation. We've received 73,000 doses. We've given out 15,000 in the last 24 hours. So as the week progresses, you'll see those numbers as doses given going up. The federal programs you can see, which is the retail pharmacy, Walmart, uh, CVS, Walgreens, uh, you know, they are continuing to give out uh, their vaccines. They receive some uh, primarily now through uh, Walmart uh, as the federal partner. Uh, the others were allocated in terms of the long-term care facilities, which has primarily been done. And so you'll see uh, continuing reporting on that. We are in currently phase 1B of vaccine administration, which is our Kansans age 65 or older, as well as education workers, including K through 12, child care as well. And uh, let me just review a little bit for a second. Uh, if you look at all of 1B, which is all of the categories in 1B, uh, that's estimated to be 520,000 people still remaining to be vaccinated. If you look at uh, the fact that we are getting conservatively 82,000 doses per week and we have four weeks left in March, uh, that would be uh, 328,000 doses that we're going to receive versus 520,000 that needs to be vaccinated in 1B. But of course, if you look at 70% of the 520,000 that we need to have vaccinated in 1B, that's a closer number of 364,000. So 364,000 to be uh, administered the vaccine with anticipated 328,000 doses coming in. Now that supply could increase some, so I think we're close to meeting that goal of finishing uh, 1B by the end of March. And if you'll remember, we did move 65 plus in there. So not only are we doing the original 1B, but we're adding over 100,000 of 65 plus to that mix as well. And so we're making progress step by step. And so hopefully that's a word of encouragement for those in the 1C category that at some point in April, uh, we want to get to you. And if the supply increases, we'll get to that sooner. And that leads to uh, the announcement for today that I'm expanding uh, phase 1B after consultation with our Secretary Romero and Department of Health. 1B group will be expanded effective today to include food manufacturing workers. And the food manufacturing workers includes meat processing and grain, oilseed milling. This is estimated to be 49,000 Arkansans in these groups. This will be from poultry processors to uh, meat processors to grain processors. Uh, the, they can arrange through their employer primarily, uh, which the employer will be trying to set up clinics for these workers, and they can be arranged at their work site, they can be arranged through their local provider, and the employers will be working through that process. They'll also be available through other community pharmacies or clinics around the state. And the reason uh, we feel comfortable in uh, adding this addition is because if you look uh, this month with our vaccines coming in, we're on schedule and we want to stay on schedule, we need to add this additional group. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm pleased to announce that based upon the call with the White House Coronavirus Task Force today that uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will be increased by 700,000 nationwide for the state allocations, which means about 
2,500 to 3,000 more doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine to Arkansas. Uh, in addition, of course, we know that J&J &J has been approved by the FDA and that Arkansas will receive 24,000 J&J doses for the first time uh, this week and will receive them later this week uh, for distribution. And that J&J &J vaccine is what's going to give us an extra margin that we can move in and start with our poultry workers and our other food manufacturing workers that have uh, been identified. And let's go on to the uh, next graph. Uh, another thing that we want to do is to continue to increase the availability of vaccines in rural parts of our state. And so our Department of Health uh, will be designating one location in each of the public health regions uh, for vaccine distribution. These clinics will be set up and held each week in counties with low vaccination rates, and it'll be initially on a first come, first serve basis, but we envision having next week a, a, a statewide toll free number that can be called to help uh, identify where they can go for these vaccine clinics. We'll provide more information to you next week on that, and those locations will be provided in our, on our Department of Health website when they're specifically identified. No out-of-pocket expense, just bring your insurance card, and if you have insurance, uh, they can uh, bill their insurance. But don't let anything stop you from getting your vaccine. No out-of-pocket money is required. And then you can return for your second dose at the designated time. If you go to the uh, uh, next graph, you'll see the initial counties that we're targeting, uh, which is Lee County, Mississippi County, Dallas, Pulaski, and Conway will be the areas that uh, will have these Department of Health uh, run vaccines to local health departments. And then we wanted to be able to see how we're doing in terms of the percent of the population. So we have moved through the 70 plus population Arkansas and based upon the Department of Health data, it looks like we have vaccinated 50% of the 70 plus. Now, that, and that's one dose, fully vaccinated 24.7, which those will soon uh, uh, get their second dose as well. Uh, how do I think this uh, represents how we're doing? I think it shows uh, some resistance uh, to uh, the vaccine that we need to overcome. We wanna make sure we continue to encourage those that are in the right age group, uh, the right criteria to get the vaccination is critically important for our entire success in ending uh, this pandemic. So we, it's a good place to be now, but we want that number to increase. Dr. Merrill particularly to see, like to see that 50% uh, uh, get up to 70%. The next uh, graph, uh, let's go on to our cases. And if you look at our cases, we continue to hold steady, uh, if not be on the decline. And there's a, some significant good news here uh, particularly in the hospitalizations, that you can see our hospitalizations have declined another 25 and the ventilators are down as well. <clears throat> you look at our number of new cases, right in the middle there, total cases, and then the change from yesterday, we have 440 new cases uh, with uh, uh, increase of 12 active cases and four deaths. We're always saddened by those deaths, but we're very glad that that number is so much less than it has been in previous weeks. Our testing uh, is modest. Uh, it's uh, about almost 5,000 tests, uh, uh, and we like to see it higher, but it's just a reality of where we are today with that lower testing. And, and then if you look at the uh, uh, next one, you'll see the trend lines. And of course, that spike right in the middle of that is because we filled it in with data, it was a data correction over the weekend uh, that showed that one spike and uh, that was really reflecting cases that was coming in from January and I think before February 14th as well. Uh, so with that you can see we're still in the right direction in terms of our cases. Uh, and let's go to the next one. Uh, hospitalizations go down, great news for us one of the lowest points in hospitalizations uh, since last August. Uh, and then number of active cases is still 
uh, in the right trend direction. All good news there. Uh, and then you look at the positivity rate, 10%. It's where we like to stay below, and you see how many, for a month over a month, we're way above 10% positivity rate. Uh, that uh, is down below 10% comfortably, uh, and we want to keep it that way because that indicates uh, less transmission in the community. And then I believe that's the end of that. <clears throat> Let me uh, uh, close by saying before I turn over to Dr. Romero that uh, our Department of Health, working with the CDC, has confirmed uh, for the first time a UK variant in the state of Arkansas. Uh, this is a result of our surveillance testing, working with the CDC that identified this uh, UK variant. This is not a surprise to us. Uh, we expected the UK variant to be here. It's just simply a matter that it has now been uh, documented that the UK variant is here. And it's a reminder that we have to be cautious uh, we have to remind ourselves that the virus is in there and what the uh, scientists say about the UK variant is that it is more contagious. And so for all of those reasons, uh, let's continue uh, to uh, adhere to the guidelines and uh, let's uh, do everything we can to get vaccinated so that we can be safe. With that, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Romero for his comments. Thank you, Governor. Um, so um, yesterday, um, the uh, ACIP of the CDC um, uh, authorized uh, the use of uh, Johnson's new va vaccine, um, approved that also in addition to the FDA and made recommendations for its use. Uh, that vaccine is uh, highly efficacious in preventing death and hospitalizations. Um, it is uh, authorized for use uh, among the wide population of the United States uh, when the time uh, comes. Um, it uh, does prevent uh, death, as I said before, and that is a major uh, um, advantage of that vaccine. There were no deaths in the, in the study group. Um, it appears to be uh, no more reactogenic than the current vaccines, um, and um, we don't think it's going to have uh, the uh, very, very, very small risk of anaphylaxis, but we'll see once we use it uh, in public. We will be receiving that vaccine and distributing it uh, out through the, straight, the state uh, without any specific um, designation for that vaccine. So uh, that advantage of that vaccine is that it can be stored at room temperature um, and it can uh, give immunity after one dose. So whereas the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines require two doses of vaccine to become fully immunized, a single dose of the Janssen vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will give you that protection. So um, when available, uh, take advantage of being able to get that vaccine. With regard to um, our immunization efforts, as the governor has said, um, we've uh, achieved about 50% 50 50 uh, immunization in that uh, older age group. Um, we want to see that get up to 70% because that is herd immunity. Um, once you have that group, that, that, that degree of immunization in that group, that, that herd, if you will, is protected. Um, if we add the 65 to that group, it's going to drop a little bit, but we're going to push that forward and we will be able to hit these numbers. Um, we are distributing the vaccine uh, efficiently at this point. Uh, we're trying to, um, to equitably distribute the vaccine among our, our uh, counties and, doc and uh, sorry, Colonel Ader is doing that. With regard to the variant uh, that was identified, it was, as was mentioned by the governor, um, this is not something that we did not expect. Um, I, I, I'm surprised that we hadn't found it earlier. Um, it simply reminds us that we need to, man to use the mask, um, regardless of whether it's a mandated uh, uh, issue or not. Uh, we need to keep these masks um, and use them. Um, and it also uh, reinforces the need to immunize. Without immunization, we won't be able to protect against these variants. So again, the vaccines that we currently have available are effective against the UK variant. So I'll stop here um, and turn it back over to the governor. Thank you. Let me invite Secretary Key to comment on our schools. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Arkansas schools are recovering from the weather situation we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think most of those schools that had been impacted by uh, the uh, damage to their buildings or to water pipes uh, have been able to return on site. We continue to work to identify and calculate the damage due to that. 
But I do want to point out that uh, Arkansas schools have and continue to have a successful school year, especially when you compare uh, to states around the nation who have still yet to return to on-site instruction. Uh, if you review the uh, recent CDC uh, guidance that was reissued uh, within the last couple of weeks, and you compare that to how we have been operating in Arkansas, it very much parallels uh, what we have been doing here uh, through the entire school year, which has been a, the biggest contributing factor, is we have worked with schools to follow the guidelines, and with all the good news that we have now uh, about our case counts, this is no time for us to let up, especially in our schools. Our, our in-school case numbers are reflecting uh, the positive trends in the communities, and we want that to continue. We have concluded a successful wrestling season, or are in the process of concluding. Uh, we're in the process of concluding a, a successful swim and dive season with respect to our student athletes. And now we're going into tournament season with basketball. So I would just encourage all of our schools, uh, all of our personnel, all of our parents, and, uh, and our students to continue the good work that you've been doing so that we can continue to have a successful school year uh, and, and uh, um, in this school year uh, with, uh, with, with optimism that going in the next year uh, that, that we'll be back to what we all hope would be a normal uh, school situation across the state. Thank you, Governor. With that, we'll take any questions. In terms of the expanding the 1B group, um, What's the reason that you chose the food manufacturing workers? Uh, excellent question, and the answer is uh, we look back on the history of our cases and where we had uh, early uh, spikes in cases, uh, breakouts, as well as deaths, and, and we had uh, uh, a real jeopardy with uh, those that were in the uh, food processing uh, industry. and so. Uh, again, uh, we wanted to move them in there first because they work all of those that are in the category that I identified of agriculture, uh, food manufacturing. Uh, they work close in proximity to each other. And so that was the reason that uh, they're on the front line. They're obviously an essential worker, but in addition, uh, they're an exposed worker because of that, and uh, we wanted to uh, move them in. Is it only certain types of people who work in that industry, like who actually work on the front lines, or is it just anybody who, who works in that industry? Uh, anybody who meets that category is eligible. Was there any consideration for restaurant workers? Because uh, I'm sure you've seen some restaurants kind of went full barge with it uh, starting on Friday. Uh, so was there any credence given to them, considering you know kind of what the trend looked like, at least early on? Uh, the uh, restaurant workers are in what category? Uh, one C. One C. So they're in one C. So hopefully we'll get to them soon. Uh, we recognize that uh, they need vaccinations as well, but that's a category that uh, the CDC guidelines have recommended them to be in. Well, and then what's kind of your reaction to seeing some restaurants? I know there were some in Saline County. There were some in Little Rock that kind of went back to operating as normal once some of those guidelines were sort of loosened up a little bit? Well, we encourage them to have uh, appropriate uh, precautions in place. Uh, most restaurants continue to follow the guidelines, which is space limitations, but also uh, the uh, servicers to wear uh, a mask, which is uh, still a requirement uh, if you can't socially distance. And so we want them to be careful. And, uh, and then we also want the consumers, you know, don't go to some place that's taking risky action. So don't go, don't go someplace that you feel uncomfortable or they're not taking the right precautions. Reward those that are. Uh, I think that's the uh, marketplace. And uh, everybody knows today what is necessary. They need to act on what they know. Dr. saying that, you know, mask mandate should probably be in place until maybe 2022. Um, so I guess, you know, how do you respond to that considering, you know, we're looking at the end of March to maybe lift that mandate? Uh, well, uh, I've set out that 
Uh, I think what Dr. Fauci says that if you want to take every precaution, maybe that's a good idea down the road uh, to continue. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've had my vaccine. Uh, I'm 70 plus, so I've had my vaccine. Uh, but I continue to wear a mask, both to set a good example, but also because they're still studying as to whether it is transmissible even though you've had the vaccine. And uh, uh, so I think we're going to learn a lot between now and then, and hopefully uh, that will not be necessary, but uh, we'll continue to listen. And clarify, in those five specific counties, is that going to be open to all residents within that county? Because I know we're focusing on um, some of those counties that have lower vaccination uh, taking, or is it still going to be 1B categories, even in those? No, they have to follow the categories. So yes, uh, good point, good question. So even with those, it's first come, ser first serve, but it needs to be within that category. And that's important because as we go into having a, uh, uh, a, a toll-free number that you can come and they can assign you someplace, uh, that would inundate us if they called uh, when they weren't in the right category. If they're in 1C, they're calling now, it would clog the system. Uh, it's gonna be challenging anyway, but you need to make sure you're in the priority and qualified and it's your turn and then uh, we'll help get that set up. Let's go remotely and see if there's any questions. Uh, hey, Governor, Andrew Epperson here from KNWA News. Uh, we've gotten reports from people who have medical conditions serious enough to where their doctors are giving them notes saying you need to get a vaccine as soon as possible, uh, but they can't right now just because of how the state's set up. They're going over state lines to Oklahoma or Louisiana to get vaccinations. Uh, just because of how those states are set up. Uh, have you thought about perhaps moving these folks up to 1B um, and why, if so, or if not? I, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Romero comment on that. I would say at the outset, we've talked about it a lot and the CDC guidelines is so broad in the, uh, in the uh, underlying conditions that it would be well over a million people uh, in Arkansas. And for that reason, we can't just bring them all in and, and have uh, those vaccinated uh, early. And so we believe when we lowered it to 65 that we're gonna be catching the most vulnerable of those with underlying conditions. And so we chose to take that path. Dr. Merrill. So um, our guidelines are are uh, based on uh, those recommendations from the ACIP. The ACIP made their recommendations based on the issue of availability of vaccine um, and risk factors for the individual. And so uh, those individuals with uh, comorbid conditions um, are considered at risk um, and were um, uh, distributed to the 1C category based primarily on the amount of vaccine that would be available at the time the, vac the uh, guidelines were, were determined. Now. As we have more vaccine, as vaccine ramps up, there may be some shift in this, but we're still staying with that recommendation because we think it is the most equitable. Um, it is it uh, fairly the vaccine within the population, and we still are targeting those individuals at highest risk for complication um, and death and the highest risk uh, that, ha that has been demonstrated throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Next question. Yes, Governor, uh, this, this is Rose with KATV. Um, this could be a question for either you or Dr. Romero. I just want a bigger explanation as to this data dump and where, where was the problem in terms of why these cases from January are now being reported? Do you want Dr. Sima to handle it? Dr. Yes, or Dr. Porter, whoever has yeah. uh, I'll ask uh, our data experts to uh, come up here and to uh, talk about this. Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, we did uh, do a data cleanup uh, this past weekend. This is not the first time that we have done it. Uh, the speed at which data is generated, transmitted, analyzed has been considerable throughout the, this entire pandemic. We do have quality control mechanisms in place to identify when issues uh, arise. And then when we identify those issues, we make uh, our, our partners aware of that. And then we make the correction because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're getting the data out to, the, to our, our stakeholders and to the people of Arkansas. And if you recall, uh, and Dr. Sim, I think uh, uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong here, but in times past, it might be a, a commercial uh, provider that sends in the data late. It might have been uh, happened in January, but they save it and send it in in one batch, which we don't ask them to do, but that allow, that's an accumulation. And so that's one factor that allows, uh, that has to be uh, cleaned up and uh, inserted into the system. Uh, another question. Governor, this is Jacqueline Froelich and with KUAF and PR. And my question is off topic. It regards your decision on SB 24, stand your ground. Uh, I will make uh, an announcement on that tomorrow uh, on Stand Your Ground and uh, uh, voter ID also is pending so uh, that uh, final decision will be made tomorrow and we'll make sure everybody's aware of that. Good afternoon, Governor. It's Brett Rains with 4029 News. Can you provide any additional information about the first confirmed case of the UK variant? How that person's doing? What region of the state they travel from out of state? Please provide more details if you're able. Sure. Dr. Romero. So for reasons of HIPAA, we would not disclose that information uh, because it is a sole case and uh, we can only tell you that the case occurred in the state, um, that that uh, data was reported to us um, and uh, the uh, virus has been confirmed by sequencing um, but from the Tennessee State Lab. So we know that it is uh, a, a variant, but uh, we're not at liberty to give other information regarding the patient itself. Thank you. Another question? Governor, this is uh, Andrew with AP. I uh, had a COVID question and a non-COVID question for you. Um, the, the presence of a variant in, in the state, uh, would that uh, factor in at all to your decision uh, on whether to, to uh, lift the mask man, a mandate uh, by, the, by the end of the month? Uh, would, would, that, uh, would that enter into your thinking on looking at that? Um, and the non-COVID question I had was, uh, as a vice chairman of the uh, National Governors, Governors Association, wanted to see if you had any thoughts on uh, Governor Cuomo and the allegations against him and whether he should resign as chairman of, uh, of NGA because of them. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And in reference to uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, anytime you have allegations that are made uh, by someone, in this case a woman, uh, very serious allegations. Uh, they need to be uh, given a level of, uh, need to be given credibility. And uh, I'm glad that there's an independent investigation ongoing. Uh, and I think we should all wait to the results of that independent uh, investigation and uh, see where uh, that conclusion uh, leads everyone. Uh, and in terms of the NGA, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, the chairmanship is uh, in the Democratic governorships, and so they control uh, who represents them, although it's the entire NGA, uh, it is selected by the uh, Democrat governors, just like uh, I was put up as vice chair representing the Republican governor. So it's a little bit different situation than normal. Uh, but I think we should all wait until that independent investigation, which needs to be uh, conducted, is concluded. Uh, in terms of the variant and the mask mandate, uh, I thought you were going to ask the question as whether uh, if I would have uh, changed the directives to guidelines uh, last Friday had I known a variant was here. And the answer is yes, because I presumed it was here at the time. And so while the variant's presence is always a factor that should be considered, uh, the most important factor to me is uh, the level of community spread, uh, the number of cases, uh, but also the hospitalizations. And we have set very specific criteria uh, that we would have to meet before the mask mandate would become a guideline. And that has to do with cases. Uh, it has to do with positivity rate as well as hospitalization. So we're gonna watch that criteria and, uh, that's, and, and that's the reason we set that so we'd have something objective to look at as we make the decision uh, next end of March. Any other questions? Governor, this is Shelby. Hi, Rose. Governor, this and is Allie Lynch with Five News. Uh, about 
um, SB6, the near total abortion ban, um, that is expected to be heard in the committee today. Do you have a statement regarding um, that bill itself? Uh, listen, I'm getting a stack of bills that uh, are somewhat uh, controversial, and uh, I'm going to look at those one at a time. Uh, tomorrow, I need to deal with uh, Stand Your Ground uh, and make a statement on that, and I will. Uh, there'll be a couple others, and then uh, SB6 uh, looks like it will get to my desk. Uh, I've always historically signed every uh, pro-life bill that's come to my desk. Uh, this one uh, has caused uh, some pause because uh, it is a, uh, a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade. It does not include uh, rape and incest as exceptions, but I want to uh, look that over, look at the uh, 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 prospects of it, and then make a decision, but that will be down the road as well. I believe I answered that. Hi, Governor. Yes. This is Allie Lynch with Five News. Um, there are several Arkansans going weeks without unemployment paychecks. I was wondering, has the Department of Workforce Services given you an update on what may be happening there? Uh, I get regular updates. Uh, I've made it clear that if there's resources that are needed, we want to be able to provide those resources to process the claims. Uh, clearly from the national news, everyone sees uh, the uh, outbreak of fraud and the concern about fraud and the processing of those claims. And so that uh, complicates it along with uh, the fe strict federal guidelines that have come along. So uh, they have assured me that they're putting resources to it. They're processing them as fast as they can, following those guidelines, trying to prevent fraud and uh, we want them to be able to process those as quickly as possible because we know the legitimate claims really need to be uh, completed. Uh, so uh, that's all I have on that now. Uh, if there's uh, more detailed specifics, we probably need to uh, bring in or have a, uh, Secretary Preston to uh, speak to it. With that, um, go ahead. I, uh, one, fi one final question here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is this is Benji Hardy with the Arkansas Nonprofit News Network. Um, I wondered if, if you could talk about your thinking in adding these subgroups of 1B one at a time rather than opening the door to the rest of 1B. And when it comes to the 1C group, which is a you know an, an even larger group of people, um, any thoughts on, on which subgroup within 1C would be added first? Uh, and that's a very good question. And uh, you know, we could have just put all of 1B and have at it, and then it becomes chaos. Uh, it would be uh, overwhelming our pharmacies, our hospitals, uh, our vaccine providers, uh, our personnel, and it would not have been uh, uh, nearly as organized as it is now. Nothing is ever perfect, but that's our thinking, that you can take a more manageable chunk of uh, uh, statistics and people and put them in uh, and add it to the category, open it to them, and that's the, the, the best way to proceed, and I think it's proven to be uh, somewhat successful. Um, you know, as we move on, uh, it, we may or may not follow that continued uh, pattern. A lot of it will depend simply upon the supply of the vaccines. If we would have had uh, 500,000 vaccines coming in at the beginning of the month, we would open it all up, but we're not having that. We're having a certain amount every month, and when we get to 1C, it'll depend upon what the supply is at that point as to how open uh, we make it and whether we do it one step at a time. Colonel Ader, do you have any comment on that? Thank you, sir. You know, the whole thing is, is that, you know, we, we are controlled by the amount of volume of vaccine that's coming into the state. And so, you know, if we open it up too wide, then we, we stress out the, the ability to actually provide those vaccines. But it, it slows down the process for the people that we've identified as a priority. You know, so we've started off with 70 plus, we've moved it to 65 plus. If we just go 1B and just open it up, then those people are going to have a tougher time being able to get the vaccine and it just slows down the process. So by keeping it tailored, it allows us to direct and be very efficient, but also very, very targeted in who we're trying to get vaccinated so that we're addressing the needs of equity. Sir. Thank you. We've covered a lot of territory today.
And uh, with that, thank you, and uh, have a good afternoon. All right, you've been watching the governor give his weekly COVID-19 update about the pandemic here in Arkansas. Just want to go over a few quick numbers for you. If you missed the beginning of that newscast or that news conference, rather, uh, he announced that phase 1B will be expanding today to include those in food manufacturing. So that is an expansion of the COVID vaccine distribution plan in the state, which it currently has been for those 65 and older and educators, along with everyone in phase 1A. Today, those in food manufacturing have now been added in to uh, be eligible to get the vaccine. That's about 49,000 people living in the state that fall under that category. He did also give some insight into how many vaccines are coming into the state each week. Right now, we sit at an average of about 82,000 doses per week, which puts us for the month of March at roughly 370,000 doses. And he did say that those left to be vaccinated in phase 1B are more than 500,000 Arkansans. So even if every single dose is given out within the month of March that comes into the state, we will still be at only about 70% of those in phase 1B with um, vaccines. So obviously, as you heard there mentioned at the end, uh, the issue of not expanding the phases up larger is due to the supply, the limited supply coming into the state. But good news, we did hear that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the third vaccine approved for use in the U.S. US is now on its way to Arkansas with 24,000 doses headed to the state. And of course, that number will continue to grow as manufacturing of that third vaccine is available. But the state also saying that, uh, as we've heard on the national level, that you should get vaccinated with the one that you are offered. So no need to prioritize Moderna, Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. Get the one that is offered to you. We will have much more from this news conference available for you on our website, 5newsonline.com and coming up in our newscast at 4, 5 and 6. We'll see you then. Chances are you have some questions right now. Here are a couple answers. Lysol disinfectant spray and Lysol disinfecting wipes together can be used on over 100 surfaces and kill up to 90.